All right, so my name is Becky Wallen. I am the field fork coordinator for the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. Um, I've been hunting white-tailed deer since I was 11. Uh, it's something I loved uh, doing. I, I learned with my dad. He kind of got into it later in life and, and taught me and um, it led me to my career, which is pretty awesome. So um, tonight we have two awesome guest speakers, Rachel and Scott Kroom, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Sorry, I had to go off unmute for a second. I'm Rachel and I'm Scott Kroom. Yeah, it's really nice to see everybody virtually. And um, we're both volunteer hunter ed instructors for Kentucky. And we've helped a lot with the field to fork classes through our membership with the Sportsman's Club, uh, Fern Creek Sportsman's Club that we're members of. And so we hunt publicly in quite a bit and we're just excited to get to chat with you guys tonight and hopefully um, answer some questions and maybe get you guys outdoors and, and enjoying the stuff that we love to do, so. Awesome, thanks, Rachel. Um, so without any further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and dive into some general public land information for Kentucky. I'll start by saying that Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources owns, leases, and manages more than 85 wildlife management areas in the state. Um, and because of that, and uh, in addition to partnerships with other agencies and organizations, there's more than 1 million acres of uh, public land available for hunting in Kentucky that's managed and waiting for you. Um, so the biggest question is, where can I find this public land information? So I'm gonna start sharing my screen here, and we're gonna navigate over to the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources um, webpage. So uh, if, Rachel, if you could give me a thumbs up that you can see the webpage. Sweet, thanks. So there's a lot in our website, a lot of excellent information. We're gonna navigate over here to the hunt tab is it's a drop down here and towards the bottom you'll see two um, links here wma and public land search and wma is just a, the abbreviation for wildlife management area and the wma and public land info so we're going to start with the public land info page and what you can see here right off the bat, there's a lot of links to other relevant information um, that is related to public land and public land hunting in Kentucky. There's um, one very important piece of information here is the hunting guide. So you can see there's all guides uh, hyperlink right here. I've already got it pulled up. Okay, so this is the Kentucky Hunting and Trapping Guide for this year. We reprint these every year, and this is probably something familiar that you have seen um, at your local Walmart or Ace or Bait Shop. We try to send these out to multiple partners. Um, they're free, so if you see one and you need it, you can just pick it up. Or um, we have this online, like I just mentioned, and you can download it. You can download it to your phone, take it with you. Um, very first thing about the guide, I just wanna go through this, not page by page, but just if you have not looked at it before, um, this can kind of give you some foundation to jump from. So first thing I'm gonna point out is everything that is new for that hunting season is going to be in the front and it's gonna be in this beautiful light blue color to help it stand out. It's also organized, organized by topic. So that's typically what you're gonna see in the very front of the, um, of the hunting guide. And it has all of the new information. Um, you can see it's, there's bear hunting information, concealed carry information, species specific, but it also talks about the new public land hunting information. 
There's also a section in the guide just for public land information. So I'm gonna scroll on down here. It's typically located towards the back. Um, and there's a lot of really good overview information to start with. A lot of things that are commonly asked questions, you can find your answers right here on this um, list that we've put together on these first couple of pages about public land hunting. And then you'll see that we've got the areas divided up by the hunting, um, by the regions, excuse me. And this is just to help you kind of get an idea, okay, say um, I'm up here in the bluegrass region and all of these points with numbers are WMAs or public um, access areas that I might be interested in depending on what county I'm in. So I can look down here and find the bluegrass region list and the no numbers correspond. So if you were most interested in number five because that was close to you, then there's number five there. Then you know, okay, the name of that area is John A. Kleber WMA. So that's, that's a good place to get started. And then they have the quick guides, which um, can be a little overwhelming if you're not used to looking at the charts, but um, it is a quick reference to let you know, okay, if you're interested in the Boatwright WMA, um, specifically the Swan Lake unit, you can see right away that it is open because it's in blue here for the deer archery and crossbow season. And then anything that is an exception to the statewide regulation will have a number that corresponds to the explanations at the bottom. And so the same number can be used for multiple WMAs and that's how that quick guide works. It's not all of the information you'll need for those WMAs. For that, we'll transfer back over to the website for quick. We're back on the public lands hunting page. As we scroll down, we see all of the new information in that same color blue. And a lot of the same information from the guide. General information about hunting on WMAs and access to WMAs. But what's really cool about the um, web page here is that you actually have the hyperlinks to more information that you might be interested in. So let's switch over to that other page in the drop down that we saw the public, the WMA and public land search. This is very handy if you're not sure where you wanna go, but you absolutely know that you want to go hunting. So they are, these little icons are actually, you can select them and it generates the list of all the WMAs in Kentucky that allow hunting. So that is super handy. You can also narrow it down by county so let's say we know that we want to go hunting in uh, Madison County. So this gives us the WMAs that are closest to us. Let's go a little bit farther and say that we selected Miller Welsh Central Kentucky WMA. We can view all of the specific information to that WMA it shows us the county, where the county is located in the state. Um, it gives us some information like how big it is, uh, contact information, which is uh, really handy. We have public land biologists out there um, all across the state, and you can contact them to ask specific information about public lands. Um, that's just part of their job. That's what they that's what they do, they're, they're here to help. So if you have questions, don't be afraid to call that number or reach out to our general information um, contact, information center contact. Um, another really handy thing here, and you probably already noticed, is the directions. So that drops a pin on Google Maps and you can just plug in, get directions from your home and it'll lead you right to the WMA. 
So let's go back because I want to show you the last really important event, uh, piece of information from this type of page on our website. It's the printable map. So we generate PDFs, here we go, of all of our public land access areas. And you can see right here that it, it very clearly outlines the boundaries of the WMA, the parking areas, and some of the key features within the WMA like the trap range is located here, the archery range, the tube range, which is for rifles. It shows you in purple the handicap accessible area on this WMA. Um, but what most people are concerned about is where does this property stop and someone else's property begin? So this, I think everything gray kind of faded out is not part of the WMA and everything that is in full color is part of the WMA. And again, there's also the general information about the property and a legend to kind of keep you oriented on each map. All right, one more tab on the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife webpage that I wanted to show you all is the maps tab. So this is a quick list of all of the maps that we generate. Things like the game maps, which give you the zones for specific game species and things like the public land um, or the public dove fields. So if you're interested in things like that, you can find maps for those here. Some of them are interactive maps and some of them are PDFs. Any of the PDFs you can download or print and take with you. Um, then we get into our interactive maps. So the first one here is the wildlife management areas, public hunting areas. Um, this, the, this page generates a whole, the whole list of available access areas. But what we want to go to is get an overview of the hunting areas with an interactive map. So this takes us to an ArcGIS platform. Um, it's, it's pretty user friendly. Right away you can see the outline of Kentucky and all of these stars are public access areas. Whoops, went it the other way. Hold on, we're going for a ride. Okay. So as you zoom in, you start to see the outline of these properties. And when you click around, let's go here. I think somebody in the chat was interested in yellow banks. So we can click here. It automatically gives us the name of the area, a quick bit of information as to how big it is, um, that it is a WMA. We can zoom straight into it to kind of get a better look here. And if we click more information, it shoots us right back to where we were um, on the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website. So I really like to use this map in ArcGIS to kind of just survey around to, um, what areas are close to me. And then it automatically has a base layer of topography of the area. So um, this green line, by the way, is the WMA boundary. So you know where it stops and where it ends. And I can see the creeks that run through Yellow, Brain, Yellow Bank, um, the, the roads here, and the general topography of the area. Let's go back one more time. Remember our maps tab? So we jump back to take a look at this interactive map that is generated through Kentucky GeoNet. And this one is just a little bit prettier. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> I hope nobody gets seasick from me driving. Um, so they, this one has the icons, um, popular icons you can see, and we can actually pull drop down lists to see, okay, what we're seeing right now are the horse trails and the wildlife viewing areas. And all of this is um, 
you can adjust it to see what you want. This drop down list right here, you can filter by the activity and then the area that you want to go. So if you already know where uh, the name of the area, this is pretty helpful. Um, it'll just take you straight to it. So let's say we're going to go to the Aurora Marina. We jumped to it and then you would just close this. I think it's up there on the um, Ohio River there. So I, that is quick and, and um, not super in-depth overview of what kind of information is available at fw.ky.gov. And I'm gonna drop all these links over in the chat for you guys. The last thing I wanna talk about um, is the Explorer app. So right here you can see we have the ArcGIS Explorer mobile app instructions right there on our website. It's a PDF that takes you step-by-step, -step, um, basic way to get started using an app for a mobile device that has all of the information we just looked at um, nicely packaged on, and you can access it on your phone. So um, that app is user-friendly. Um, this tutorial is exactly how I got the app downloaded onto my phone. And um, I did use it during a mentored hunt in Eastern Kentucky where you would think, um, you know, you wouldn't necessarily want to rely on something like your phone, but you can download the maps and have those ready for even offline use. So that covers everything that I wanted to share with you all. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and give it over to Rachel and Scott. Well, hello, everyone, and good evening. Becky, thank you so much for that information. And uh, we're just going to kick off with some of our, our stuff. If you guys have questions, don't forget to put it in the chat, and we'll try to get through all of those towards the end of, of our presentation here. So um, we're going to mainly talk this way and then share some slides with you, but mainly you'll just get to see mine and Scott's face the whole time. So the benefits of hunting public land for us is there's a million acres in Kentucky. So we don't have to be married to a spot. Um, I can say like when I first got started deer hunting, um, I was always going to the same stand all the time. And that gets pretty boring. if You're looking at the same piece of woods or same oak tree or something over and over again. So there was a lot of adventure in store for me. Um, Scott introduced me into public land hunting and I thought it was so cool that, you know, we just get, had all this land just at our disposal to be able to go check out. So, um, and it also provides you the ability to get out and learn things about the woods. So you'll notice sign as you walk around, um, trees, deer trails, that sort of thing. So where typically, if you're hunting the same piece of private, in Kentucky, most of our private locations aren't very large. You can learn that small piece of ground, 150, 100 acres, in a rel relatively short time. But a large piece of ground like public, you know, if you're talking 6,000 acres or 2,000 acres, you could just, you know, it would take you a while to figure all of that out. So, so that is my favorite part of, it, or favorite benefit to public land hunting. So and then we're going to public land etiquette. So this is kind of a, an interesting thing for me when we talk about like safety and stuff like that. I've, I've seen a couple questions about that, but um, it's just nice to know that like the correct etiquette is even if you had planned and spent all your time researching to go to a spot, if someone's there, if someone is there first, you just have to take the nice way out and wish them well, tell them good luck and go to your plan B. Um, I think it's important to make conversations with folks that you're meeting on public land. Um, they're out there hunting just like we are. So maybe chat a little bit, um, and share some stories and, and maybe make a hunting buddy or a friend while you're out there too. I think that's, that's one big thing. You know, it's, a, it's an intimidating thing for somebody that might be new to it or, you know, you, you're getting out there for the first time and, and just sort of unsure what kind of experience you're going to have and what kind of people you're going to run into. But I really think you'll find that um, 
you know, if you do happen to, to be a, at a, a, an access point or a pull off or whatever the case may be, and just make a conversation with somebody, you know, you're not trying to pump them for information or, or, or kind of uh, interrogate them, but just, just an honest conversation about, hey, uh, I, you know, I'm thinking about going over here, you know, you know which direction you're going to go so we don't bump into each other. And, and uh, you know, in, in my experience, you know, you know, say 20 plus years of, of spending a lot of time on public land, most of those interactions have been you know, very, very well. You know, people, you know, don't want to bump into each other. So just, just having that conversation uh, usually goes, you know, way easier than, than what you might think, so. And then the last piece for um, our like etiquette portion of this is just to pre-download the maps and make sure that you know you're on public land, where you're where you're supposed to be. So there's a lot of spots that Scott and I will go to and we know that we're not gonna have cell service out there. But if you pre-download the maps on your applications, if you're using that, um, mm -hmm. you'll know that. And then there's also red line boundary markers on most of the areas. So you'll visibly see those afield too. So just be aware of those and what they look like and, and that sort of thing. So I'm gonna show you guys, I'm gonna sh share our screen here really quick. All right, so here's an example of boundary markers. This is just like one app that we've used in the past and it'll show you different property lines here. Um, it'll show the same thing for public. Now I will say that there are some applications that I know aren't correct um, with every line. So it's important to kind of look at that on your phone but also be aware of your surroundings if you're on public land too. Um, just watch for that red line and do you have anything to add to that, Scott? The main, the main point be, there being that, uh, and this might be really uh, base level stuff for some people, but for somebody like me that's not uh, you know, technically inclined, uh, you know, the, these maps in these areas, you can pre-download that to your phone, have the app on your phone, and you don't need cell phone service to use as, as GPS. So like that screen you're seeing there with that map and that blue icon, your phone would show you that and show you where you're at in relation to the boundary with or without cell phone service. And that's, you know, it's not something you want to rely on or, or, or you know, you, you don't want it to be a crutch. Uh, but it can certainly be a tool. Uh, but but what Rich was saying about the the lines being uh, you know maybe not just uh, exactly right. Uh, that's something we found quite a bit. And, and usually in my my experience, that I, I haven't noticed them be off by you know a quarter mile or anything. But it might be 50 yards or 10 yards, or so, in some cases 100 yards or something. So just just be aware of that. But it, it can be a good tool to uh, sort of keep you in bounds a little bit. Okay, so uh, that's just kind of just some basic uh, public land etiquette stuff and just, you know, uh, big thing there is just try not to be intimidated and just get out there and, and go for it. Um, so what we're gonna talk about now is um, how to choose a location. You know, a million acres is a lot to pick from and, and, and you know, it can be uh, kind of overwhelming, like, well, where do I start? So uh, we'll kind of talk about some things to think about and things to apply on, you know, how to get started on this, um, where to hunt and where to and where to look. So uh, one big thing, talking about the million acres and having, you know, not being locked down to a spot or married to a spot, that, that is one big benefit uh, of public land that you have this all this this uh, access and land at your disposal. Uh, so don't lock yourself into one spot. Don't lock yourself into two spots. The, the more places and, and more, and, and I don't just mean WMAs, I mean different areas on a, you know, on a given WMA. Uh, having a, a plan A and a plan B and a plan C and, and on down the line uh, is going to be a, a big benefit to you. And whether that's from, you know, you dealing with hunting pressure or you dealing with different wind directions, and we'll kind of get into that. Uh, but just having options and, and not putting all your eggs in one basket is, is a big, big part. So, um, but anyway, uh, how to choose a location. Uh, you know, there's no, uh, there's no magic pill here. There's no secret recipe. Scouting and intel really is the, the key. You, the, the more you know about the area, the more you're familiar with the area, the better off you're going to be and the more educated decisions you can make. And that sounds really simple and basic, but it, but it really is just that simple. Um, so some things we do, there's kind of like, I guess, maybe three kind of arms or components to our kind of scouting routine. Um, the first of that being uh, late winter and early season, uh, or excuse me, late winter, early spring uh, scouting. And, and what that entails is, you know, we kind of call it shed hunting, but really what we're doing is we're out putting on a bunch of miles in say February, March, and maybe early April. 
the point there is we're trying to get out before green up, before spring green up while the woods are still dead and everything's kind of that dreary, uh, kind of beat down, wet, you know, muddy. But it, but it lets you get out and really dive in an area and, and learn the area, learn the terrain, and, and still learn sign. At that time of year, you're still going to be seeing rubs and, and scrapes and deer sign and all that leftover sign from that previous fall. Um, and that's the one time of year that you're really not concerned about your intrusion and your pressure. And you can really dive in there and learn an area. So um, that probably is, is one of the main keys to you really getting familiar with it, with a given area. And, and the other thing too, is you're not, you're not concerned with bumping other hunters. You know, if you're out there in February, the only other person you're going to run into basically is going to be somebody doing the same thing you're doing, shed hunting, scouting. Uh, there's no concern really with, with bumping into somebody and, and messing up their hunt. So uh, it's, a, it's also a great time to get outside. We're sick of being stuck inside from all the winter and nasty months. And, and I'll say too, like, I can't remember much. So that the apps really come in handy for me when I'm out, if I want to remember a certain location or certain sign while I'm out, out scouting. So I definitely recommend that for late winter and early spring scouting just to keep, you know, keep your memory right. I that's, guess. that's a great yeah. point. That's a great point too. Cause if you're really getting out and covering ground and looking at a lot of stuff, you're, you're, you're not going to remember all this stuff. You're not going to remember all the little fine details and things and dropping those waypoints and dropping those little clues to kind of help you remember, you know, you can look at something in September that you looked at and, you know, you, you look at a waypoint that you dropped in February and go, Oh, that was a, you know, a certain pinch point for a West wind and it kind of jogged your memory. So, uh, getting an app and getting familiar with it is, is a big component of that. So uh, scouting that time is, is a great way to just really put some miles on and learn an area. Well, that doesn't really apply to us right now. Here we are, it's mid-October. And, you know, if you've done that already, that's great. If you haven't, you know, you, you can still absolutely get in there and, and go after it. Um, so kind of two components to go about it now uh, is your map scouting and digital scouting. That's one of the things that Becky was showing there with the mapping. Um, and, and things you can do there. Um, there's a ton of, you know, apps out there, you know, on X, hunt stand. I mean, it, there's dozens and dozens. Find one that you like, you know, just find one you're comfortable with, get acc acclimated with it, and, and just get familiarize yourself and use it. Uh, and we'll kind of talk about, it's, I, I want to be able to show you on a map. I've got some, some hunt scenarios I'll show you here in a little bit, um, but uh, I'll, I'll kind of show you a little more detail in a minute on what kind of things we look for um, on, on map scouting. But basically what you're going to find there are those pinch points, terrain features, you know, using, using topo maps, you can see the terrain features and how, you know, flat or steep an area may be. Uh, and then with aerial photos, you can also see, you know, what may be potential bedding uh, and feeding areas um, and, and, you know, just kind of the nature of how things lay. Uh, one, one thing I do like to focus on too, if I'm looking at aerial photos, I really like to find one with, with wintertime aerial shots. If you, you know, some apps will have like a summertime shot where all the leaves are on the trees and your woods are going to look just really monotonous and, and really hard to pick apart. So if you can, if you can find one with, with those winter aerials, what you're going to see there is all your uh, deciduous trees, have, you know, they've lost their leaves, there's nothing on them, but then you can also see your cedar thickets and like, you know, evergreen type trees, mainly cedars uh, around us. Um, but you can kind of see how that, that cover may lay. And then a lot of times you can even see, you know, fields and, you know, if a field's kind of an overgrown field or whatever the case may be. Um, the key point there too is that that stuff is dated. You're not getting live info on that, which kind of takes you to the last point of scouting. And that's right now, that's in-season scouting. That's you out there, you know, getting, getting your feet in the mud and going after it and learning what's going on um, right now. Um, so, you know, all that kind of ties together. Um, and, and it's, and it's all, you know, I, I wouldn't do one without the other. Um, but, but definitely the in-season scouting is going to be the one that, uh, really, um, kind of tells you what the deer are doing right now. Uh, I, I don't know. I think some of you guys were here, uh, maybe on last week's when Jason was talking about, uh, oaks and, and different types of oaks and everything. And this is real relevant to this time of year, you know, mid-October, um, We've got a pretty pretty fair to pretty good uh, nut crop this year, hard mass crop with, with the oaks, the acorns dropping. Um, and what you're seeing there, I think something Jason talked about were, were white oaks and red oaks. And uh, the leaf you see on the left there, that's a white oak. Uh, that's a leaf out of a white oak tree. Uh, the one on the right is a, a leaf out of a red oak tree. And those are actually 
species, but, but moreover, they're, they're uh, family groups of trees. So there's multiple types of white oaks and multiple types of red oaks. Uh, deer definitely feed on them both. Um, but the identifying feature there is if you look at the, the leaf on the left and look at kind of the ends, the tips of those lobes, you notice how they're rounded. It's just, a, just kind of a soft round edge there. And if you look at the leaf on the right, you can see that bristle tip. You can kind of see that hair-like tip on that leaf, uh, which is going to uh, signify that that one is, is a red oak or a member of the red oak family. The point there being that, generally speaking, your white oaks are a sweeter, more highly preferred nut. Um, oftentimes, they may drop a little earlier as well, like, you know, in the, you know September and, and you know, mid-September. Uh, your red oaks, may, depending on the species, may, you know, drop a little later and may not be quite as highly desired, um, but that'll kind of give you an idea of what you're looking at. Like I say, I know we talked about that a little bit last week, and I'm not sure we had a good clean picture of that, but, uh, uh, but yeah, that's something that's going on right now is, is the acorn drop is, is in, in full swing right now, and deer are definitely in the woods um, feeding on that. So um, that's, that's some of the different types of scouting, um, but yeah, uh, you know, in-season scouting is kind of your, your, best, your best option for what's going on right now. Uh, and kind of getting that live info, you seeing it happen or seeing, you know, finding a hot tree that's dropping and has, has good sign under it or your rubs or scrapes or just that, that deer sign that's really active uh, is it, probably the most uh, important thing. Um, so that's kind of a, a part about the scouting from the, from the deer side of it. Now, another component that I'll look at too when it comes to, to public land or really any type of land is I, I'm, I'm looking for deer sign and I want to read that deer sign, but also want to read hunting pressure sign. So when I'm going into an area on, on public land, you know, I'm definitely looking to see what level and, and, and how fresh that deer sign is, but I'm also looking at people sign too, okay? So if I'm, if I'm using an access point that's, you know, it's on a main highway and it's a real nice, easy parking lot and just everything is just really just easy access. And, and you know, every time I pass by that access point, there's two or three or four trucks there. That's probably something I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on. Uh, I'm, I'm probably gonna be looking uh, for something that's just a, a, a more overlooked access point, a more obscure access point, something that, um, you know, maybe is a more hard access, uh, stuff that's just really obvious and really blatant, you know, you're not the only one seeing it. So, um, again, there's a lot of land out there. Um, in my experience, I've had much more success really focusing on those, those you know, hard to get to places uh, and, and overlooks spots. And, and when we say hard to get to places, you know, I think the first thing that comes to mind and it, and it sort of gets thrown out there a lot is, well, go far, you know, walk farther than everybody else and, and get in deep and, and, you know, put a, put a mile between you and the road and, and look in some scenarios that can certainly work. I mean, you know, if you get in there deeper than, than the average person, you're going to leave a lot of people, you know, that, that don't go further than two or 300 yards from the truck. Uh, but in my experience, that's not, that's not something that comes into play. Like a lot of the public that we hunt, whether it's public access or hunters coming off a of private, you know, their own private that borders the public, uh, there's just not a lot of places I can get a mile from, from a true access point. So um, when I say hard access, sometimes it is go, it's going far and going, going way deep into public land, but, but more often than not, it's, it's, there's a barrier there. There's uh, water, there's a, a creek that's too deep to, to cross. Uh, we use water access a lot, uh, you know, and uh, whether it's, you know, by boat or if you've got a canoe or a kayak or whatever, uh, that's something that, that really will open up uh, a lot of your access um, is using that water and separate you from a, from a lot of folks. Um, but just kind of think outside of the box on that. Uh, I, I've, I've walked in areas, too, that, that are, you know, it might be some random part, it might be a random parking lot or, or some other parking lot on, on a WMA that's not technically a, uh, you know, a, a hunting access, but it's still touching public ground and, and still a hunting area. So just trying to kind of think outside the box on access uh, is going gonna, is gonna to help you kind of beat that hunting pressure. Because in, in all reality, the deer, the deer don't know where they're living. They don't know, you know, the property lines don't mean anything to them. They, all they know is what kind of pressure they're receiving from, from hunters. And uh, so you just kind of, kind of look at it, I guess, like that and and try to sort of beat the, uh, beat the pressure. Uh, all that being said, uh, <laughs> we're going to talk about, uh, some, a big thing I want to talk about too is kind of understanding wind direction and kind of getting some of these maps and just kind of talk about uh, sort of scenarios and, and how we would look at things. Okay, 
so uh, we're, we're going to use this map for a few uh, a few different things. Um, but this is an example of a, of a hunt that I actually made earlier this year. Actually, a couple. There's a couple hunts uh, in this in this map right here. So what you're seeing here, and I don't know if you can see my see my pointer or see my uh, cursor. Go. Okay. Uh, so obviously you got a lake right here. You got a, you got a body of water. You got woods. Now you can see here what I was talking about about the wintertime aerial. So you can kind of see, you know, see how these woods look up here and kind of more open. And then you sort of see down in this stuff. You kind of see that green growth and 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 you know that that thicker um, looking cover. Uh, that's going to be more cedar trees, and you can kind of see some of it in here. And then we sort of kind of get a little bit more open area over here too. So uh, that's that's one place where the um, where the wintertime aerial will help you. Um, but but let's use this like we you know now I didn't know this area going into it. Uh, it this this wasn't a spot that was totally I was totally blind to or anything. Um, but um, we'll, we'll just use this as though it's it's a a map, and I can tell you about a couple hunts I made in here. So one important thing is when we're looking at, at, at digital mapping and, and your apps and everything. A lot of your apps you kind of, you have the option of orienting the map. Uh, northward, and that's how this is. So, so straight up on what you're seeing right now is north. Obviously, down is south. Um, but you can also, on a lot of them, you can you can orient to the way you're facing, which for me gets really confusing. I guess maybe some people see it better like that, but I I would advise most folks to to lock that screen on on fixed north, and that way when you start looking at your wind directions um, and, and what wind you're dealing with, uh, it, it everything will be oriented in a way that kind of makes sense. So. Uh, it kind of covers some base level stuff here. When we look at wind direction and, and you look at, say, like a, a weather forecast, and what I use a lot of times is nothing special or any kind of, you know, trick. Uh, I don't have any real trick. Uh, weather apps. Yeah, I don't have any, good, you know, any top secret weather app for you, but just weather, you know, weather channel or whatever. We'll look at hourly weather a lot and we'll see, you know, what that hourly wind forecast is. And I, what I'm looking at is both for the speed of the wind, but mainly the direction of the wind. Uh, so when I when it tells me I've got a west wind, what that means is that wind is going to be blowing. If it's doing what they say it's going to do, it's going to blow directly from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. So so the, a west wind is out of the west and blowing to the east. If, if it's a northwest wind, it's coming from this top left corner and coming down at an angle. Okay, so uh, I'll I'll kind of explain what I did here and, and the hunts I made in this area. So I had a I had a chance to make a morning hunt. I didn't have a whole lot of time. I had a couple hours. And you can see looking at this, that when we talk about pinch points and we talk about funnels, what we're talking about there is just kind of a real generic sort of version of just terrain or a feature that would sort of pinch deer movement. It, it would just kind of funnel or sort of force deer movement, you know, theoretically through a certain area. And there's a lot that goes into that, it's, you know, it, but, but on a map, uh, it's something that would, you know, kind of pinch that that movement of those deer. So one you can really see is, is this little bitty finger of woods right here is if deer were coming from the wood lot that's to the west here that you can't see over here. That's that's a would be what's called a pinch point. I've also got one right here and between this, this is a hay field up here to the north. It's just a, a field that's mowed for hay, which I actually do not have access to. So the only thing I have access to is from this wood line to the south, everything to the south. But you can see the pinch between kind of the head of the lake here, the, the top end of the lake and the edge of that woods. And that's and to give you some reference, that's about 80 yards across. So it's not a real tight pinch by any means, but anything coming from this field or the woodlock to the west uh, and coming back over into here um, is getting somewhat pinched around the, the head of that lake. So what I did is I had a couple hours one morning to make a hunt quick, and this spot's close to my house. So I, I ran over there and made a quick morning hunt. And I was probably, I don't have a waypoint of where I was, but I was probably sort of where this cursor is right here. If you can't see my cursor, I'm a little bit uh, southeast of, of where that red uh, dot is. Uh, I made a hunt and, and kind of what I expected was, I expected deer to be coming from the west uh, and back over into this stuff to bed. And, and that morning was really calm. I really had almost no wind at all. Um, and I did have some deer come through. I didn't get a shot at anything, but I had, I had deer do what I thought they would do. And they came from from the west and came over here to bed, and and uh, that was kind of that. I, I didn't get a chance to hunt real long that morning, but what I did, and, and this is uh, something, and, I, and I, sh I should have said I'm accessing from the south here. I'm, when I'm accessing, I'm accessing from down here and actually walking up the edge of this lake uh, and into this little patch of woods here. Um, but when I left that morning and I got down, 
I, I like to try to make the most use of my time out there. And so I, I, I try not to just walk back, you know, just with my head down on the same path I came in on. I try to kind of cut a circle or, or sort of walk through an area and, and, you know, find what sign I can and, like I say, make the most use of my time. Well, when I did, I really only went about 40, 50 yards, and this is pretty thick, so I can't see very far. I can only see probably maybe 20, 25 yards in, in most of this woods up here. But when I cut my, my scouting loop when I was leaving, that red waypoint right there, I found a chinga pin oak. I found a, it's a type of white oak. Uh, and when I got to that tree, I could hear it drop, and I could, I could hear acorns dropping pretty, pretty regular. But when I got kind of inside that tree, sort of inside the drip line or where the, where the branches of that tree would hang over, the ground was just all pawed up. There were acorns on the ground, acorn caps on the ground, lots of deer droppings. The, the, all the leaves and everything was just disturbed under, under that tree. And there was a lot of what I would call feed sign under that tree. Uh, again, it's a white oak, so it's a very, very highly preferred nut uh, this time of year. And I should say this hunt, this hunt was, oh man, when was that? Third week of September, is that right? Okay. So some probably about the third week of September is when this happened. Uh, so to give you a little context there, uh, but again, I'm le I'm leaving the woods at this point. I had to be somewhere midday to uh, to be somewhere, but but I found I found this chinka pen and it's just beat up with sign and there's buck rubs and sign all underneath of it. So anyway, I, I make note of it, drop a waypoint, leave, go do my thing. Well, it's just eating at me, and I and I really want to get back and hunt that tree because the sign is just so hot underneath of it. There's just really really fresh deer sign underneath of it so i actually go back and make a hunt that evening in the, basically the same spot but i'd adjusted and you can see the the orange kind of uh triangle or i guess the, the circle inside the orange that's actually the tree that i hunted and that's about 25 yards from the from the chinka pen and that, and that night i actually had a, a an in east wind okay so kind of an odd wind so my in, my wind was coming uh, from the right of the screen to the left and i set up you know, to put myself downwind of that tree, thinking that, you know, I'd watch these deer coming in here in bed, and I, and I felt like, I, I didn't actually watch them bed, but I watched them go into that area, I should say, and felt like they were bedded right in that, in that thicket or in this thick stuff over here, and they would be coming from that direction, and my wind should be blowing back here to this field, um, so I set up for an east wind. Um, here's where it went wrong. <laughs> uh, all that was fine and good, and I did see a lot of deer that night. What where, where it took a, a turn uh, south was typically your east winds aren't, aren't very strong winds. Sometimes it'll happen, but, but usually east winds are kind of a weaker wind. And you'll notice a lot of times, like right at last light, that wind will lay down and get calm. And what happened at that point was, now I don't have a topo map here on this one, but if you could imagine this drainage that's feeding this lake, it's not really a true creek bed, but just kind of a, kind of a gullier drainage that, that falls off towards this lake. So like up here, it's higher elevation and the lake is obviously lower elevation. And what happened at, at probably that last half hour, 45 minutes of light is my thermals started pulling down to that lake, okay? So we talked about wind direction and wind direction is just like carbon directions on a map. So north, south, east, west, that's just the way the wind's blowing. What a thermal is, is thermal, uh, a thermal pull or, or your, your thermals are gonna be, I think we have another slide maybe. Your thermals are going to be how that wind pulls during the, the heating or, or cooling of the day. So over here on PM, what, what's happening is that sun goes down, air starts getting cool, and you know, just like uh, you know, hot air rises and cold air sinks, that cool air starts sliding down that hill and it kind of rolls off that, that elevation or off that slope like water in the evening because the air is cooling. So what happened, and conversely in the morning as the sun gets hot, uh, starts heating the ground, heating the hillside, that warming air slides up the hill. And, and that can be totally independent of your wind direction. So depending on how the slope and how the terrain is, how the terrain lays, you're gonna have wind direction, which is up here, you know, over top of your head, but you can also have this, this thermal action in the morning and it's go generally going up and the evening it's going down and it's just because of the warming uh, or cooling of the air. Let me go back to the map. So to wrap, wrap this one up, how this hunt went bad for me, I didn't get a shot at a deer. And I should have, because I had, I had quite a few deer that evening in range, and that was a really hot tree. But what I, what I should have accounted for is I should have favored more to this downhill side, because when these deer came in, what, what and this, you're gonna find this to be very, very common, 
they'll circle in downwind and they're going to put their self on the downwind side uh, of where that destination food. And, and what these deer did was they came to that tree, but they just barely did swing down kind of in that gully. And even though my wind direction was to the east, it kind of laid down and now my thermal's pulling straight to the lake. So now my wind, where it was at my back, now it's coming right off my right shoulder. It's coming right down to this lake. And those deer walked into my thermals and got my wind and, and busted me. So um, that's an example of getting really close and it didn't quite work out, which, it, which happens. And it's something I'll say too, uh, unrelated to, to this, but uh, don't get discouraged on public land. Look, we, you know, I've been hunting, I've been hunting public. Public land is, is probably the majority of my hunting in the fall. Um, I spent a lot of time in the woods in the fall and have since, the, you know, on public since probably the mid or late 90s most times it doesn't work out okay so just kind of get it in your head that you know you're just trying to learn and get better none of us ever get to a place that we're ever you know an expert or anything we're always learning and trying to improve um and just know that like it's not going to work out most times you know if I, if I go out and have a shot opportunity you know say one in five or one in six hunts that's a that's a pretty good you know ratio for me uh this year hadn't been nearly that good so uh, you know, just keep your head up and keep your head in the game and, and, and realize you're going to fail way more often than you're going to succeed, but that's just part of the game. And, and so having a realistic ex expectation is, is good. Uh, so anyway, that's a little bit about uh, sort of wind and planning for thermal pool. Okay, and I'm going to take over and we're going to talk about helpful tips and gear for hunting public land deer. So, so we're going to talk just real quickly about staying mobile. Um, me and Scott talked a lot about this because we feel like most um, maybe new hunters don't know or new public land hunters don't know where to start as far as like um, getting access. So this is just some options for you. It, you, can, you can go walk in a spot and sit on a bucket. If it's a new spot and you're learning stuff, you don't have to get in a tree stand. Um, my advice to you is I would probably stay away from a blind I would, I would tell you to maybe buy a ghillie suit or a leafy suit before I would purchase a, a hunting blind. That's just me personally. But here's some options from left to right. So this is a, a climbing tree stand. So pretty much you're, you're shimming yourself up a tree. Um, all three of these, we're gonna wear harnesses, right? So we have, we're always hooked in, into the tree and staying safe. Uh, the middle one is a lock on in sticks. And the sticks work, it, that's what you climb up. It's like the ladder portion. They work independently from the stand and hang these, and then you hang those. And then a saddle, which I haven't used before. I've just tried one on once. Um, but you have a tiny little stand that you stand on, and it pretty much is what that guy looks like on the far right, that little hammock saddle thing that, he, that he's in. So I will say there's a lot of ladies in this class. Um, I hunt a lot with both the climber and the, the stand and sticks. Um, I'm by no means this crazy strong person or anything. I don't work out 15 times a week. I just have equipment that I've learned how to use. Um, I'll keep going here. Um, other tip is learning to field quarter for purposes of being self-reliant. So that's a big one, um, especially for if you're doing it by yourself, if you don't have a buddy with you. And specifically if Scott and I, shoot a deer will help each other drag it out but if you're not going with someone else he quarters it out a lot if he's by himself or if we get down in a place that it's just going to be unbearable to drag a deer out there's really a lot of benefits in quartering a deer you just throw some game bags in your pack and hit the ground running yeah i think that's one big thing that, that holds all people up is like well how am, I, how am i going to deal with it how am i going to get it out and, and, and what do i do how do I, you know call for help and all this um it's something that's not utilized a whole lot around this part of the country or whatever, but you, you might hear it called gutless method or field quartering or whatever. And there's a ton of good YouTube videos on how to do that, but essentially you're breaking down the deer in the field. Uh, you'd be putting it in a, into game bags or whatever, and you're, you're packing it out piece by piece. So you're leaving probably the, you know, say on a hundred pound doe, you might only be packing out, you know, say 45 pounds, 50 pounds at the most of quarters and, and boned out meat. Uh, but you can take it out piece by piece. So, so, uh, you know, that's, that's one place where, again, talking about hard access and getting in the spots, something being remote or bad terrain, steep terrain, it stops a lot of people just from the, the standpoint they get intimidated on how they're going to get a deer out. So, uh, 
Uh, it's something to look at, and it doesn't take any special equipment. I, I, I field core with the exact same knife I would gut with. The only thing special I carry, I carry two pillowcases. You're looking at two pillowcases on my stand right there. So no, no fancy gear. It's just that's when we quarter them. We put the meat, we put the meat in, uh, in pillowcases to keep you know dirt and debris and leaves off of it. And it's nothing fancy, but it works, and, and it keeps me independent of having to call for help uh, if I get one down in a bad spot or something. And I think uh, lastly in the presentation, uh, Scott put in to carry less gear. I think this is a crack at me because he says I carry too much because I always have extra snacks in there like I'm going to be a field for 40 days. Well, it's, but, not, it's not a crack at anybody, but but look at your gear. And, and, and this comes with time and experience and everything. And I do the same thing every year. Every year that, that pack you're looking at right there, I take it and I dump it out. And piece by piece, I really kind of weigh options on, you know, how much I'm – carrying and how much I'm using it and, and I think that's one place where maybe somebody getting new to it you're kind of bombarded with all these products and and, and things and it can it can be overbearing and, and be a burden to you on how much you're carrying how much weight you're carrying how much noise you're making um, you don't really need a heck of a lot of gear to go to go deer hunting so you know there's things that help I mean have a you know binoc a good binoculars range finder a thermocell in early season by all means carry what you need but just maybe assess that kind of stuff and, 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 you know, as time progresses, think about what you really need. So don't forget your little Debbie's too. Yeah. About two. I, talk, I talked about a hunt that didn't work out. I got it. Now I got to talk about a hunt that did work out. So uh, this actually is a hunt on public ground. This is a hunt. Was it last year? I think two years. last year, two years ago, uh, we made a trip to a spot. Um, I don't guess either of us had ever hunted before. Um, but I kind of want to talk about, uh, you know, in, in the previous spot, that was a spot that I kind of knew and had walked the area. So, so it wasn't just maps I was relying on. Now this spot here, uh, this actually is a spot that we had no prior experience, had never stepped foot in it. I, the only, only prior scouting I had uh, was just looking at maps. So, um, okay, so what you're looking at here is, um, this is actually a website, hillmap.com, and it's a pretty cool website that uh, what, it, what it does, it'll, it'll show side-by-side -side maps and whatever I do, this is just a, a screenshot so I can't move anything, but um, if I move this map over here, it would be a mirror image on this side, just in a different terrain. So it's really kind of a handy thing to look at because I can see my aerial photos over here on the right side, and then I can see my topo lines over here on the left and sort of get an idea how the terrain lays. So what I did, what I did on this hunt is uh, basically the public that you're looking at, and it might... Uh, Kind of make more sense here on the, on the right side of the screen. The public is pretty much all the woods you're looking at and this field right here, okay? Um, there's some houses down in here that aren't on public, but, but pretty much the majority of, of all this block out through here, back through here, and I'm pretty sure all this field, it might, maybe a little corner of this wasn't um, public, but, but all, that, all that was on, was on public. So um, my thought being, and again, sight unseen, I didn't know anything about the spot other than what I'm with what I'm seeing here was I could see over here, you know, I saw that field and, it, and the field looked like an overgrown field from what I could see on, on aerial. This, this picture was a little bit different than what I had to go off of, but it looked like a grown up field. So, um, you know, that's kind of stuff that I like. I, it just as a real basic, you know, place to look. I like looking at, you know, just really simply edges and kind of breaks in terrain or breaks in habitat where maybe two different types butt up together, you know, overgrown field and hardwoods or, just, just edges of, of habitat. But what, what the neat thing is, if you look at this top red dot, or I guess the southernmost red dot, you can see those topo lines get real kind of steep and, and pitched, you know, they're, they're stacked on top of one another, and they push right up to the edge of that field, okay? Now, you can't really tell that from the aerial photo over here, but you can definitely tell it by cross-referencing on your topo over here. And that's a really deep, steep gully, okay? That's a, that's a gully that, you know, I could cross it if I had to, a deer could cross it if it had to, but it's definitely going to want to walk around the top edge of that gully rather than diving off through that thing and, and, and fighting that steep terrain. But anyway, uh, but so that's what I was seeing, and, and that kind of jumped out at me was, was seeing that, that steep gully that butted up to that field, and there, and there is some woods there, maybe a 20-yard wide strip, but I really like that kind of little pinch around the top of that gully uh, and, and not knowing anything, I just, I just felt like that would kind of pinch movement around the top of that gully. So where I access from, you can see the red dot to the north off the water. We, we took the boat to there, and I accessed from right there. And then you can kind of see the red trail um, from, 
you know, where I walk, I kind of kind of gain some elevation, kind of walk side hill for a ways and then gain some more elevation going on up the hill. And my thought was I was just going to scout my way in and sort of, you know, just check sign as I went. And if I didn't find anything that really suited me, I really expected to see, you know, a pretty good trail around, uh, around the top of that gully. So I did that. And, and uh, actually, uh, funny enough, I had it, I pulled in that little cove where the, where the top red dot is. And there's a couple, couple fawns actually on, in the water out there playing and swimming around. So I thought that's kind of, you know, sort of whatever, I guess, but uh, I walked on up and, and actually the first, the first bend in that, in that red line, I actually uh, jumped a pretty nice buck, jumped a pretty nice 10 pointer. Uh, I say I jumped him. I, don't, I think he was actually walking. I just kind of came up in a, in a little gully and, and he was there uh, about 30 yards or so. Um, so, you know, that definitely kind of caught my attention. Uh, but there, where he was at, there really wasn't anything specifically that, you know, even though I saw him right there, there wasn't anything really specifically that made me think that, you know, I really wanted to hunt that. So I kind of kept, I kind of continued on. And eventually I made my way up to where that blue dot is. And I keep in mind, my intent was to go to where the red dot is. Um, but where that blue dot is, I find a chestnut oak that's dropping. Uh, big, large, kind of glossy acorn. It's, it's a member of the white oak family. And when I get to that tree, actually before I even get to the tree, I can hear the nuts falling. So it's, it's kind of, you know, it's raining down every, you know, 15, 20 seconds, every 30, you know, several acorns a minute are falling from this tree. And when I get, again, when I get inside that, that drip line of that tree, I can just see the ground looks different. I can see the ground is all tore up. There's fresh deer droppings. There, there, there's, you know, droppings from that day, droppings from, droppings from the previous couple days. And everything inside that tree is just all pawed up and matted up. And it looks way different than everything outside the tree. And, and that's basically what I was looking for. And even though I didn't find it, you know, at that gully where I had intended to go, that was the hotter sign. So, you know, that looks like hot, fresh feeding sign that's happening right now. So I climbed on that tree. And again, I'm, I'm hunting in a mobile method. I'm hunting in a way where I've got my stand on my back and I'm ready to hunt in any, any given place. So I go ahead and I hang on a tree right there. I get downwind of that, of that uh, chestnut oak, probably 15 yards or so, to 15, 18 yards. Uh, and I hang my stand and I make my hunt. And, this, and again, this is in the evening. Uh, so, uh, hunt there and probably, I don't know, probably an hour before dark. I have three does come from, if you're looking at the topo map, I have three does come from basically the east, kind of that point that would go out to my east. Uh, three does walk into that tree just like they had, you know, been caught on a string and came into about 12 or 12 or 14 yards and I made a shot on the biggest one and, and that was a successful hunt. So uh, again, it doesn't always play out that way, but that's just a, a scenario of looking at something on a map, having a game plan, but then also having, you know, keeping an open mind and keeping your eyes open and adjusting and adapting uh, as you go in there. Cause I didn't go to where I planned to. I, I got close. I got within about 75 yards of where that, that last red dot was, but I found the sign I wanted to find and it worked out and I made a, uh, I made the hunt I wanted to make. And I should have mentioned too, I, I skipped over earlier. Uh, the wind was from the South on this hunt. So the wind is blowing and, and that's part of the reason the access is the way it is. And I went in the way I did is so the, the wind's blowing from the bottom of your screen straight to the top of the screen, south to north, it's a south wind. And the other point too, like we talked about thermals earlier, with me having that gully, what would essentially have been at my back, uh, when I'm at that blue dot, that gully's at my back. The benefit to that is once the thermals start falling, that cool air, the wind dies down, that cool air falls down, my thermals just fall down in that gully and head out towards the lake. So, so the difference in my wind direction and my thermals really aren't much different, but in either scenario, it's pulling, it's pulling my wind and my scent away from where the deer are, which, you know, which was that, that chestnut oak. So uh, again, that's just one scenario of how to look at maps and, you know, making a plan and, and when things work out right, that's how, that's how it can go. So I guess that's kind of all we have. I know we went a little long on time. Uh, and it's like I say, it's a lot of information uh, to squeeze into an hour or so. Um, I'm sure there's things that, that maybe, uh, you know, weren't fully clear or, or you want clarification on. Uh, I guess if you guys have any questions, uh, shoot them in the chat and we'll, we'll hang out as long as you guys want to talk and, and uh, try to help you out. Thank you guys so much. That's a lot of great information. We do have quite a few questions waiting for us in the chat. I was trying to scroll up to find the um, 
so that we could address them in order. So we did have a question from Kevin. Are you allowed to access a WMA via an area where hunting is not allowed, i.e. a state park, as long as you're only using that as an access point and not for hunting? Um, so I can go ahead and address that question. And the answer is no. Um, it'd be pretty hard to explain um, to an, a conservation officer that you're not hunting on the restricted area, you're just moving to the area that is open. So uh, avoid that scenario if you can. Um, all of our WMAs have really nice um, outlined parking areas. So uh, try to use those to access your um, WMAs. All right, and Let's find the next one. So Cynthia, I, um, I don't know if you were able to follow up with me. You said, uh, don't you have to worry about the silver contaminating the meat when you're quartering in the, in, I guess, in the field? Um, I wasn't sure what you meant exactly by silver. You might be thinking of silver skin, if you can confirm with us on that one. But silver yes, membrane. Yeah. OK, here we go. He's talking to me, but she can hear us. We're unmuted. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, maybe she's talking about silver skin. If that is the case, if she's talking about silver skin, uh, it's not something we, we worry about. Um, um, I, I do try to trim, you know, fat and everything for the freezer and try to trim the fat and tallow off, but um, I've done it both ways. I, I, I've, you know, I've froze with silver skin on and with it off and really anymore, I probably, uh, I probably leave it on as, as kind of a freezer burn barrier more than anything. And I, and I we eat a lot of venison in, the, in our house, um, and I don't find it to adversely affect uh, any kind of taste or flavor. It ends up being more of a barrier than anything else. So if you do get a little, you know, sticks and leaves and, and you know, uh, things on it, it's just something you're going to trim, trim off right before you cook, and I don't, I don't find it to adversely affect the meat at all. So that's my experience with it anyway. Yeah, thanks, Scott. That, that was what she was... Um curious about. So we had, we got that question addressed there pretty good. Joanne was wondering, do you use a boat? Uh, you talked about water access a little bit and what kind? Yeah, so uh, and again, this is, it's, a, it's a lot to fit in. I'm sure there's little, little bits and details. I, I'm sure we left out a lot of these stories, but, but yes, we do use a boat a lot for access. Uh, in my scenario, most often uh, we've got a John boat we use. Uh, nothing, nothing fancy, nothing special, just an 18 foot John boat. Um, but that's what we use to, to access a lot of our, uh, a lot of our public. Uh, but you can certainly, I mean, canoe, kayak. I mean, heck, I know uh, kayak sales are through the roof, and and it seems like everybody's got a kayak in their, you know, uh, in their backyard, uh, ready to go. So uh, just little things like that can, can definitely get you out there. Um, and, and kind of find some of that more out of the way access. But yes, we do use a boat uh, for probably 95% of our public access. I would say too on that, um, if you're gonna use a canoe or kayak, just be aware if you're going in, you know, well, you'll need lights. Um, Cause if you're going in, you know, yes. before daylight or, or coming out after dark, you, then- You have to, that's, that's something we've ran into before is, is people coming off the water in a, in a canoe with no navigation lights. Yeah got to have navigation lights on, on just the boat. for safety and life jackets and yeah. all that stuff too which but i will say that um a lot of our wma or state wmas are around water we have a lot of lakes in kentucky there's a lot of hunting opportunities there um so i think you should all get a canoe and a paddle and a life jacket and some lights <laughs> awesome thank you well our boat's good too. <laughs> Sweet. That's definitely one of um, my goals. I'd like to paddle in on my on my little kayak and take a deer and paddle back out. I think that'd be fun. Um, so the next question is, if you find a bedding area in a WMA, how do you set up for the best odds? This map here. All right, so Scott was talking a lot about bedding. Um, in this hunt, and I don't know if he was like super clear about that or if you guys understood that, but typically, hang on just a second, technical difficulties. What he's talking about there is where all this cedar thicket is or thick stuff. 
or we'll just say that this is the bedding that you found on on public land okay so we're trying to figure out how to get to it without bumping deer right that's sure so yeah we're, when we're thinking about you know wind direction we're thinking about wind direction in terms of where we're physically going to set up and hunt but also how we access too so you know, let's say I've got a I've got a west wind, so it's my wind is blowing from left left of the screen to the right of the screen, and that all that cedar thicket and everything on the on the east side of the lake there is bedding. Well, I can hunt, you know, uh, say up there where where my waypoint is, and and you know, west wind is going to kind of blow me over just kind of the edge of those woods, especially if I if I press up against uh, that that hayfield to the north. But the problem is if I, if I, let's say I walk up the east side of that lake, so, so the kind of straight side of the lake, well, number one, I'm walking really close to the bedding where deer potentially will see me or hear me, but I'm also, as I'm accessing, my wind is blowing right into that bedding area. I'm essentially blowing up the bedding area before I ever really even have a chance to hunt it. So you want to think about access from a standpoint of, you know, or I guess you, I should say you want to think of wind uh, in terms of, you know, where you're physically hunting, but also where you're accessing from. Bedding areas are something we definitely key on. Um, really, I'd say probably for about every hunt, really. I mean, we're thinking about bedding. Yeah, and I would say that if you find bedding on the WMA and you're confident that you're bedding there, try and play out in your mind, okay, they're coming back here, but where are they coming from? So where, where would you guess that they're feeding at? So are there mature hardwoods that there's probably nuts dropping or, um, row crop fields close by yeah, there's soybeans close by they're going corn. to or corn later in the year standing corn is a great something great to find later in the year um so it's really important to, to find bedding and think like okay a deer is going to be coming back here to lay down during the day but where's he going to go to or where's she going to go to in the evening to go eat um drink that sort of thing too that, that, that's that's really i guess the biggest gist of it is you know if we're talking about a morning hunt we're generally thinking of those deer leaving a feeding area and coming back to the bedding area. And again, it goes back to scouting. So the more you know about the area and the more information you have, the more educated guess you can make about where they're coming from. And, and you know, look, really at the end of the day, it, it's a guess. You know, I mean, we, we don't have all the pieces of the puzzle. We're trying to put those pieces together. Just the more info you have, it helps you paint a clearer picture of what's going on. Um, but, but yeah, essentially the big picture there is so in the mornings, we're expecting those deer to be coming back to the bedding areas from some sort of feeding you know, feeding area. And then the evenings leaving the bedding area and then going out, you know, one direction or another to wherever they choose to, to feed. Uh, so it's definitely something that's important and, and really is kind of the basis of about everything we do just because it, it, it's kind of set up for, for everything. Even though we may not be hunting physically in the bedding area, it's definitely a component of, of what we're doing. And, and I will say too, talking about wind direction on how to set up and everything, I would say we are really sticklers for the wind. Like it, it's, the wind's not really optional. So when we look at, when we're looking at hunting an area or, or what area we're gonna go on a given day, it is totally based on wind. So, uh, you know, if, I, if I've got an area that I really wanna hunt, I've got hot sign in it, I just feel like I gotta get in there and the wind's wrong, I'm gonna go hunt somewhere else. Even if it takes me two or three days or, or you know, a few days to get back to that spot I really wanna hunt and wait for the right wind, we find, I won't speak for both of us, yes. but, but we find much better success um, being sticklers over that wind direction and, and, and really paying attention to that. I think we've both been busted enough trying to push a spot when yeah. the wind wasn't right yeah. that we just don't do anymore. But um, sometimes the deer are going to bust you anyways, and that's just is what it is. One thing I'll say too about bedding and trying to find like food sources too is you can expand that outside of public land. So if you're hunting public land, there may not be row crops there or certain food sources, but they could be close by on private. Um, now, you, where you may not have access to hunt, hunt that area, you can still have the knowledge that deer would still likely sure. be coming from that, that public or that private land on the row crops or whatever food source it is back to public. Sure, it's, it still relates to the deer hunting, even if you can't access it. Again, the deer have no concept of of boundaries or property lines they're just living in the habitat they have so it, it's I, i'm guilty of it getting fixated on what that line says and where i can go and where i can't go but you got to realize that deer just is just living in the habitat it wants to live in so you know look at it through kind of their eyes in, in, in some respects 
that did hopefully that um, I'm going to stop share, but hopefully that answered the question as far as betting and um, I'm not sure who asked it, but if you if you wanted to hop on or hop off mute, if you want to expand on that any just yes, feel free to and otherwise I'll go back to mute and just let Vic. No, it was me. But that's, that's a good answer. I was just trying to figure out because like I went to Taylorsville. Um, and I, I found bedding area on the outside like their fields are really tall right now a lot of them. And so I found bedding area that was super obvious, but I don't know. I pretty much sat right on the edge of it and just was waiting for him to come back. And I didn't know if that's the complete wrong idea that further away from it, or if it's better to be right there. I missed your last, we missed your last sentence. I don't know if it was our computer or yours, but uh, can you repeat that last part, please? Oh yeah. Just, I just didn't know when you find the bedding area, I was sitting literally like right next to it. In those sort of scenarios, I didn't know if you're better to go further away, like a little bit away, or to literally set yourself pretty close right there. Either, right? Yeah, you know, our, our perspective is we're basically bow hunters, we, so we archery hunt basically exclusively. So, so our perspective is that. So, you know, maybe that kind of colors our answers a little bit on, on kind of answers we're given. Uh, but I don't think there's anything wrong at all with being pressed up right against it so long as you've got that wind in your favor. You know, uh, I, I think you're better off being right on the edge of it with a bulletproof wind than sitting 100 yards back with the wind blowing into it. I mean, it, you just, I, I don't, I'm not concerned at all about you being right up there on it as long as you've got that wind nailed down. You know, you, you can sit back 100 yards, but if your wind's wrong, you're, you're busting those deer worse than being tight on them. So I think close the distance and get in there on them. No, it's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. A great He's conversation. Back. And thanks for coming off mute to, to ask your question and follow up. I, Becky, I did see one question like first, and it was like about safely hunting on public areas. And so I'd like to talk to a little bit about that. Um, so I think the number one thing is wherever you're going, someone needs a pin of exactly where you plan on hunting and they need to know where you are. Um, Scott and I both, I can't stress how, um, how much of advocates we are about if you're gonna be in a tree stand wearing a harness. It saved both of us before, it's really important. Um, but that's not, uh, answer to everything you could fall or whatever someone needs to know where you are if you're not hunting with someone else or if you're hunting in different areas Scott and I typically don't hunt the same areas together or he may go out by himself we always make sure one one knows where the other one is and then um, I think the other main thing is just like being aware of your surroundings like it's important like as far as scouting goes too but just paying attention to what's going on too um, I will say I've, I've hunted publicly in quite a bit and I've never felt unsafe. Um, I think everybody should try it. There's nice people out there that are just trying to hunt too. Um, so hopefully that answers some questions there. Uh, the main thing is just letting someone know where you're gonna be, so. Maybe give some context too. I know it, you're talking about lady hunters maybe feeling maybe intimidated or something on, on, or for anybody who they might run into. How often would you say that we run into somebody on public. Now, granted, we're using a little bit different access method, but the extreme exception? It's very, it's not very often, but we are um, mindful about trying to get where maybe there's not a lot of hunting pressure. Um, I, that, that's a big thing for us. Sure, so sure. Uh, I, want, I want you guys to keep that in mind too. So I don't know if that's like a fair answer really for everybody. Um, but I will say anybody that I've ever ran into has been very nice and respectful and it's been great. So, um, uh, I've never had a bad experience. Um, and that's really, I think that's, that's it. The main thing is just being aware and letting someone know where you are. So, and then any other questions that you can think of? Becky, it's on a lot, there? It's a lot to get through in an hour and we didn't do it. We ran long. So, <laughs> yeah, sorry guys. Um, it looks like that was all of the questions from the chat. Um, so I'm going to say last call for questions. I have one, Becky. Okay, Michael, go ahead. Um, in regards, I've got 
drawn for a quota hunt this year and everything, and I'm in the middle of moving, so I haven't really had time to scout the area. I did it. I've been in the area during the springtime and early summer, but I'm going to have to rely mainly on maps and possibly the Friday before the weekend hunt to do it, possibly. How would I, how would you suggest I use my time wisely and pick a spot for what, that hunt? Um, what date was the quota hunt that you got drawn for? Uh, it's December 6th and 7th, uh, Veterans Memorial. Okay, so there, there's typically like two quota hunt weekends that right. you can chose, chose for, like a November one and a December one. My right. advice would be for the December one is going to really be focused on food sources. There's not going to be, there's going to be less food available for deer at that time. We're talking probably post rut. Um, wouldn't you agree post rut? Certainly. Looking for food. Um, so I would focus on finding the food source and being in between bedding. If it was that November, early November season, I would tell you to get in really tight to bedding and try and find doe bedding um, at that time of year. But for for the December, I think food is going to be your, your main focus. And, and the thing with food there is that time of year, a lot of your, you know, with the, with the mass crop we're having this year, there'll probably still be some red oaks left by then and everything. But I would be looking real hard at security cover. You know, you're, you're talking about the first weekend in December, those, those deer have been, you know, uh, tormented and chased and, and, and been pressured for a couple months now, uh, I guess three, three months, uh, but you're on the tail end of, of a statewide uh, gun season, which I don't know that veteran, I, guess, I guess veteran isn't open for that. I'm, I'm not directly familiar with that. It's not open for gun at all. Okay. Okay. You're still going to have the, the pressure from all the surrounding properties and everything. So, you know, you're going to be dealing with just, you know, deer at, at, a, at a pretty, uh, uh, um, at a time they've just been stressed and, and pressured. So I would certainly be looking for just that really thick security cover, places that deer that, you know, can get to and feel safe and, and basically just places that you've got a hard time getting to them quietly and undetected and and uh, I, I would really look to, the, to that security cover and, and, and look at the, the thick stuff. I probably wouldn't be spending a whole lot of time in, you know, open hardwoods or in an open food plot. By that time of year, you know, everybody and their brother spent time sitting on that kind of stuff. Uh, what Where I'd be looking to find them would be the thicker security cover at that time of year. And something too, you know, we're talking about uh, something that popped in my mind too. We're talking about access and, and kind of, um, I guess un unorthodox ways of accessing properties. Uh, private ground is 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 a viable option for that too. I mean, I, I, it's not something I've used a whole lot, but there have been times that I've had access to a WMA through private ground, and, and I think a lot of times you'd be surprised on how many people would, uh, you know, if you if you you know make a phone call or knock on a door and, and say, look, you know, I'm not I'm not looking to hunt your property or anything like that, but but maybe would it be possible for me to park here and access the WMA, and that can a lot of times can take you in from a really unique angle and a, and a, and a, a unique um, access point that is utilizing the right wind direction and, and things of that nature. Um, but yeah, good luck. I, I don't like I say, I wish I had more kind of firsthand knowledge of veterans for you, but um, that time of year, I'd, I'd definitely be looking at like thick security cover and, and the, and the food sources were really close to it. So if you can find red oaks in the thickets or in, in the, you know, the thicker cover, or any kind of green growth, green briar, um, honeysuckle probably all dried up that time of year, but um, I'd be looking thick cover. And, um, you know, maybe you still have, I know, I know you said you're probably not going to get out um, or have the ability to scout like much, but if you, if you look at that stuff on like winter maps and just start marking waypoints of stuff that you want to look at based on wind and kind of lay it out in your mind, how you think the deer would would move in that area just on maps that may give you options because obviously we don't know what the dip, the wind's going to do on December 7th and 8th this year right so have a plan right. for, for the wind directions Mul I mean multiple winds yeah, yeah. yep that's going to be a key too so okay thanks yeah good luck awesome um last call for questions Anybody else? 
All right. Well, then we'll wrap it up tonight. Um, thanks everybody who stayed late. Thank you, Rachel and Scott, for all the amazing information. Your firsthand experience um, is super valuable. Um, and we just really appreciate your time tonight and staying longer to answer the questions too. Thank you so much, Becky. Thanks for having us. Good luck, everybody, and good luck this fall.